And hello everyone for the seventh seminar this time in our seminar series, International Perspectives on Corpus Technology for Language Learning. I'm Peter Crossblade, and today we have the great pleasure of introducing my colleague, Dr. Martin Schweinberger, who's going to present a talk today on an evaluation of computational corpus based approaches to language learning, which is already gathering a lot of interest, as you can see from the participant numbers. Hi, Adrian, it's good to see you again. Just going to mute your video here for a moment as we're already well into it. I apologize in advance for Martin's mustache. Um, this is a it's, no, it's Movember. There's, there's like a charity thing going on um, in the month of November. Um, but hopefully he does not keep that into December as he might scare away what remaining students we still have at this university. Before we begin, I'd just like to remind everyone to mute their microphones and to turn off their video. And I'm just going to begin as we always do here in Australia, whenever we hold any kind of public seminar or event with an acknowledgement of country in which we, i.e. employees of the University of Queensland, acknowledge the traditional owners and their custodianship of the lands on which we meet. We pay our respects to their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country, and we recognize their valuable contributions to Australian and global society. So introducing today's speaker, and again, it's, it's my pleasure to, to introduce our newest colleague at the School of Languages and Cultures, although he's been there for a couple of years already uh, as, as a postdoc, but now he's joined us as a full-time lecturer in applied linguistics. And he also uh, has a, a small position at the Arctic University of Norway in Tromso, but he didn't like it there because it was really cold. So he wanted to come back to sunny Australia. Apologize for anyone to Tromso who is tuning in today, but you know, it's cold. There's no getting away from that. Martin has specialized in computational approaches to analyzing language data with a focus on corpus linguistics and quantitative analyses, and he's certainly doing a lot of those at the moment. His research interests lie in language variation and change, language use and acquisition, and reproducibility in the language sciences. Martin is co-directing the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory, LADAL, and some of you may have been involved in the kind of sister seminar series that's been going on at the same time as this one, uh, in which uh, some speakers have been uh, joining that LADAL initiative. It's been very interesting work. Uh, he's also a board member of the ICAN group, which uh, for those corpus linguists in the room will know is one of the world's premier uh, corpus linguistics associations. Uh, and he is the principal data science advisor of the Aurora Lab at the, uh, Un the University of Tromsø, uh, the University of Norway in Tromsø. So without any further ado, it is my great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Martin Schweinberger, who is now going to share his slides and, and apologize for that mistake. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Peter. Uh, that was great introduction. I'm very proud of my massage. Um, but let me share my my slides. So yeah, very very nice introduction um, to anyone. Um, this is what I'm going to talk about today, which is an evaluation of computational corpus based approaches to language learning. Uh, the slides are available on my website. Uh, if you go there and you look at presentations and then go to um, invited talks webinars, you'll find uh, this presentation of the slides. Right, just some background uh, about things that, that Peter hasn't mentioned. Uh, he's mentioned most of it. But I just want to say that I have a background in philosophy, English linguistics, and psychology. That's important because actually I started out as someone who is not very, um, who really didn't have to do anything with computation programming whatsoever. I was really a very close reader. I read lots of books. And then over the course of my PhD, I then specialized on um, essentially computational approaches to analyzing language. Um, also, I'm steering um, 
committee member of ITAP, which is the Australian Tax Analytics Platform. Uh, and that's relevant here because the resources I'm going to show you later on uh, will be part of ATAP, and you are a little bit of what you may call my guinea pigs because you are the first people to see interactive notebooks that we're going to um, make available to the public. At the moment, they're a little bit slow, but that will improve over time. All right. Other than that, I think that's enough background. Now, I want to talk briefly about the motivation for this talk. Now, when we assess um, computational needs, tool use, programming whatsoever, it's very important to keep in mind that we're dealing with very distinct needs because we're dealing with different groups or different stakeholders. So on the one hand, we have students and the students are interested in basically learning and communicating in a foreign language. So their primary aim and motivation is to you know, get to know uh, a language. Teachers basically want to assist uh, the learners in acquiring that language, and they also want to create uh, positive learning experiences. So their motivation is, again, a little different from, from the learners themselves. And researchers who look at language learning also have a different focus because basically they want to assist teachers in assisting students in learning a foreign language, right? So it's assisting the, the uh, people who basically um, assist learners. And at the same time, uh, when researchers want to do that, they also have an obligation, of course, to produce reproducible knowledge. So to basically broaden our understanding of how language learning works and how basically the knowledge that we produce about language can be applied to language teaching classrooms. So this is very important to keep in mind that we're having different groups, different stakeholders with different interests, different motivations, and also different skill sets, right? Now, keeping this in mind, my main task for today's talk will be to basically evaluate the opportunities, drawbacks, and issues when using different tools on the one hand and programming on the other in computer assistant language learning and teaching. So this is essentially the basic theme that I'm going to uh, that I'm going to talk about in today's talk. Just to give you an outline of what I'm going to talk about or the structure of the talk, uh, in the first section, I'm going to talk about um, basically the advantages and disadvantages of using tools. Uh, tools in this sense uh, that I'm using it here also includes web applications. Right, so it's basically any software application that you use to, uh, to analyze, uh, display, uh, or extract information from language. The second part of this talk will be about the advantages and drawbacks of programming, which might sound a little bit scary, but I'm, I hope that I'll make it a little bit accessible. And because most people here are not familiar with programming, I also think I need to give you some background information about uh, motivations and important concepts, such as the computational revolution, reproducibility, and also uh, the role of programming or potential uh, uh, of programming for computer system language learning. In the third in fact, uh, section, I'm going to talk about um, uh, the lab that I'm uh, directing here together with Michael Hoare in uh, at UQ which is the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory, LADAL, which is part of ATAP, right? So the Australian Tax Analytics Platform. And both of these labs aim at basically presenting an upscaling platform for coding in HAS. Um, and the third or the last and fourth part will be to present an interactive notebook, which is an innovation that we will introduce shortly. And you are my guinea pigs because no one has seen that before. And I want to show you how you can use uh, coding actually to analyze language learning, uh, to analyze language data for language learners. All right, so let's start with the first section. So advantages and drawbacks of tools. Now, tools are really at the core of data-driven learning and corpus assistant language learning, right? So when you look at um, definitions of uh, data-driven learning. You can find, for example, uh, a very famous quote by Bolton and Cobb, uh, that the use of tools and techniques of corpus linguistics for second language learning or use are really at the heart of data-driven learning, right? Now, when we look at the definition of tools, that is uh, basically any application or software application that we use to analyze language or extract information from language, but it also includes web interfaces. So it's not only Unconc or Scale or Sketch Engine, but it's also things like um, the Koha and other uh, BYU Corpora, right? 
And the previous talks by Adrienne and Paula and Agnieszka have basically presented some of the um, uh, tools that are very useful for language learners, right? So this is basically, you know, what I understand as a tool, right? So any application, software application that can use uh, in a classroom to help you um, or to help learners um, discover language. Now, of course, tools have many advantages. They're relatively easy to use. You don't need to uh, learn a program language. You just basically download an app or it's provided for you. And uh, typically they're very user-friendly. Uh, they're very intuitive. So, um, you know, you can do lots of things with pool, uh, tools. They're very versatile and you can use them for many different things. Or if you have not one tool that does many things, you basically have different tools that help you in basically dealing with the needs that you have. Right. So also they allow you to analyze actual natural naturally occurring occurring language. So you can discover, and as we've heard before, uh, everybody's a Sherlock Holmes here, to understand how language is actually used in the real world, and that's critical. Right. Uh, it's critical because uh, as a language learner, you want to understand basically not uh, only the syntactic rules, but you want to understand how language is used in the social context. And uh, the tools basically give you an opportunity to discover that. Um, right. So also that means that they provide, of course, suggestions on how to use language in a natural manner, right? So you can use these examples that are provided by the tools to then adapt your language use. In addition, for, for uh, teachers, they're important because they assist in creating materials or they assist in corpus and, um, sorry, in syllabus design. Uh, they can be used to speed up or standardize assessment as McInery and uh, Xiao uh, famously wrote. And they also teach skills that are not necessarily only relevant for language learning, but metalinguistic skills, right? Such as basically the, uh, the use of technology, right? So it's not only language related skills that they basically offer, uh, but also more than that, metalinguistic skills. Right. So here there are really advantages that are particularly there for language learners and teachers. Right. Now, for researchers, the situation is a little more complex. Right. Because, as I said, we have different interests, different groups. And now the researchers are basically in a very difficult position because not only do they need to know and understand the tools uh, that are used that are out there and then they can recommend them to assist people but they also need to be, uh, um, need to produce reproducible knowledge, right? So the knowledge that we produce as scientists has to be intersubjective. So if I say this method works, then someone else needs to be able to, to check uh, whether that is true or not, right? And also uh, it's a problem because as researchers, we basically are at the forefront of finding new knowledge. So the tools by definition have to be extremely flexible. Right? So tools basically need to be flexible to fulfill the needs that we have as researchers. The disadvantages of tools, right, despite all the advantages that I just listed, are that, well, there are just very many different tools, right? And each tool, although they are very intuitive, uh, may require some training. And that's actually a major drawback, especially when you're in the classroom because any uh, kind of time that you take away from language learning and you basically have to uh, teach students how to use a tool is um, not quite optimal, right? Of course, they learned basically that that's also a skill, a skill that they acquire, but you know, it, it takes away from the focus of, of the session or of the, of the class. And at the same time, you also have not only more and a wide variety of tools, but you also have new tools coming in and others becoming defunct or things don't work anymore properly or they go out of fashion, you know? So basically you have this kind of huge multitude of tools that are out there. And that's basically a uh, burden on people using tools because there's just so many out there, right? Uh, now, when you, when you look at the metalinguistic knowledge that uh, students gain from interacting with technology, which is very positive, um, the negative side or aspect to that is that they're trained as users and not developers. So when you basically teach people or students um, how to use certain tools, you don't put them into the driving seat or the driver's seat, but they're basically there and dependent on the people who develop tools, which is, of course, all right. 
it's just something that we need to basically keep in mind that basically we're training users, we don't, we're not training developers, right? Another thing that might be problematic about uh, tools is that they can be black boxes. So it's not always clear what goes on under the, uh, under the hood. And that can also be quite okay. It might not be the focus, it's not really relevant what's going on, uh, going on under, the hood, uh, under the hood uh, all of the time, but it can be problematic. So for example, when you have an online corpus, for example, and you might not be aware that you can only access um, a, a small portion of that corpus for some software error, which actually happened with some of the BYU corpora. Um, so it's, it can be problematic that the tools that you basically use in your, uh, in your research or in your teaching or in your language learning um, are somewhat you know, inaccessible to you, right? And as I said, well, tools, no. tools are very versatile, but at the same time limited. Right? Because as someone who basically is into programming and designing and creating software, there's a problem that you know that you cannot create one tool that uh, is there to rule them all, right? So you'll always be faced with the limitations of tools, right? Now, an additional thing when you especially rely on commercial tools is that they make replication harder. Now, one of my focuses or my foci uh, in research is looking at reproducibility and finding out how can we improve uh, reproducibility and best practices in research, right? Particularly with respect to the language sciences. And now the problem is that if, for example, you want to replicate a study and they've used a certain tool, that tool might be, um, um, might not be accessible to you because you'd have to pay for a license or something like that, right? So there's also the problem that uh, tools can be, um, you know, hindering to reproducibility, right? Also, it's just a time issue. I mean, when you reproduce a study, um, for example, when you're a reviewer and you want to check what people have done, uh, it's just, you know, very time consuming to basically ask for the data. And then even if the data is provided then to go through the different tools and try to recreate the findings, right? So there, there's an issue with that. Now, let's look at programming, right? Now, the advantages and drawbacks of it, as we did before. Now, the advantages of programming um, are that the analysis uh, that you can do with programming um, allow analysis that are not possible sometimes with existing tools. So when you can do programming or can, when you can code, basically that gives you an extreme flexibility because you can take the data and transform it and extract information in pretty much any manner you like. So you're extremely flexible when you have some coding skills, right? So it really puts you into the driving seat, as uh, Stefan Gries put it. Uh, also, as many people know, learning to code is actually um, a skill that is valuable on the labor market. So it basically speaks to employability, right? So learning to code basically opens up uh, job opportunities that um, if you are a user, you may, may not have. Right. And one thing that I put forth is that when you have a script, like, you know, when you write code to analyze language, you can share that with other researchers and uh, then reproducibility is not really an issue because you can just uh, um, basically reproduce an entire study uh, with a click of a button. So that makes reproducibility and checking results of studies uh, much easier and thus, uh, thus enhancing reproducibility. Also something that you might, uh, that's, that's quite relevant for many of the things that we do in everyday life is that uh, when, you, when you can do coding, when you can code, that allows you to automate uh, certain procedures. So you can actually have the computer do work for you. And actually I just today um, applied a little script that helped me in, in marking um, presentations. Um, so basically you have these, you can write scripts that then speed up um, repetitive tasks. Just to give you some idea, because I used the terms programming and coding here, um, they are related, not, not exactly the same. So programming as used here refers to the use of computers going beyond just user interfaces. So point and click, drag and, drag and drop tools, which includes coding. So coding is part of programming, but programming essentially is a broader concept as well as the integration of environments, practices, or platforms that are common in workflows in, 
uh, computer and data science. So for example, version control and stuff like that, which might not tell you much is something that um, coders and software developers are, um, that's relevant to them mostly, but also to researchers. Now, similarly, we have serious drawbacks of programming, right? So obviously it's uh, a skill that has to be acquired. So it's actually quite complex and especially for, um, for language learning classrooms, right? Programming is just too complex, right? So you could argue that, well, it requires so much training that it's really not optimal to use uh, in a language learning classroom. Also, most of the program languages are not really user-friendly. Uh, it's definitely not ready to go. So you need to really have some training in order to understand, to be able to read and to also um, change code in a way that it then does what you want. And there's no immediate profit from language learners and teachers, because most of the tasks that you can do uh, with programming or coding can also be done by certain tools. But one thing that I'll put forth here is that one of the major drawbacks when I look at programming and its relation to language uh, learning is that there's actually a lack of training infrastructures. And that's not just the case for, um, for computer system language learning, but it's really the case for all of us. So there's really no proper infrastructures for training people who would be interested in basically um, learning to code, uh, working with language data. There's very little out there that you can do um, or um, that are accessible. There are resources out there, but you know, it's no real infrastructure there. Also, mostly, especially for teachers, but also language learners, there are time limits. Right? So you have very little time to acquire additional skills. Also as researchers, as you mature and you become more occupied with administration and other stuff, you just don't have the time to acquire additional skill. Right? You might also say, well, you know, I went into language teaching because I don't want to deal with that stuff. And that's perfectly legitimate. Right? So the interests and, um, might just be different. Right? Um, as a language learner or language teacher, you might say, well, it's not my thing. I'm, I'm just not interested in that. I just want to, you know, uh, basically help students uh, acquire a language properly. And that's perfectly fine. And also there might be methodological issues. So for example, you have just small data sets. You've quite, um, you, you're more uh, interested in fine-grained qualitative analyses or manual processing of data, right? So these are all legitimate reasons and legitimate disadvantages of programming. Now, why, why is it still relevant in this context, right? And so now I'd just like to very briefly uh, open up a broader picture about why I want to talk about programming in the context of language learning. And so I want to talk about computa the computational revolution, reproducibility, and its relationship to computer assistant language learning and teaching. Now, I think we are all aware that since the 1980s, when I was born, um, computation has in become increasingly important and it has doubtlessly really revolutionized the most domains of our lives. When you just think uh, back a couple of years, um, you know, computation has not been as prevalent as it is today. When you just think about ordering stuff online or booking travel, booking flights, finding partners, um, um, you think about where you're going to eat, um, where you want to order food. So all of these everyday domains of life have been affected by computation, right? And when you look at all the um, big companies that are out there today that are really the, the um, revenue, most, most potent revenue generating um, companies in the world, IBM, Google, Yahoo, uh, Microsoft, Intel, and so on, right? They're all driven by computation. So computation is really something that's really essential to our life. And one problem that I have is that when we look at the education sector, um, it has, to my mind, been rather conservative in recognizing this computational revolution, right? So yes, you know, uh, language data and computational approaches to processing transforming, analyzing, visual, uh, uh, visualizing text are and continue um, you know, to be prevalent in the economy and the humanities. But uh, when we look at the programs at the universities, actually um, 
you really, especially in the humanities, you don't find um, courses or programs that take programming or coding on board, right? It's still very rare that, uh, that you have that. However, when you especially look at um, the things that are where you use computation and language data, so something that we all are familiar with, language data, they are at the core of really the heart of the comp uh, computational revolution. So look at machine translation, text to speech, speech to text, voice recognition, search engines, Google, its distributional semantics, uh, content detection or uh, content summarization, chat box, uh, chatbots, um, question answering, spelling correction, named entity recognition, all that is really just, you know, uh, computational uh, procedures um, that are applied to language data. So the computational revolution is really at heart a uh, revolution that is driven by computational analysis of language data. And as I said, a shortcoming is, I think, Haas in general. So by Haas, I mean the humanities, arts, and social sciences, as we say here in Australia, Haas um, have been rather conservative and not fully embraced uh, this reality. Another issue that I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about is the replication crisis. So the replication crisis is something that uh, sprung out of the discovery in medicine and the social sciences and psychology, where you had these seminal experiments and people tried to replicate them. And although they were presented as knowledge in many textbooks, the experiments or the researchers who tried to replicate those experiments just failed. So that means that basically you want as researcher, as researchers or scientists, we want to produce knowledge, something that's intersubjective, that works here in Australia, that works in Brazil, that works in Turkey, that if you do X, then you'll receive Y, right? Or that at least as a tendency, if we do this, then basically something similar to Y should happen. And the replication crisis really came into being in, you know, the mid to late uh, 2000s. And it's ongoing, where basically we realize, well, we've actually published a lot of studies and very interesting and cool experiments and findings that might not be as reliable as we would like, you know, and uh, when you think about that, that's really a problem. Why is it a problem? Because it has reached the public conscientiousness. So the, the public is aware that there is a replication crisis. Right, and here's just some headlines that uh, you can find online. If you, if you look or Google um, uh, replication crisis, you'll find actually that it's a thing that people, the wider media are talking about, right? And now the problem there is that there is a public loss of trust in science. And that can be shown, for example, by Pew Research, right? Uh, and there have been substantive efforts in improving transparency in the sciences. Uh, because we believe that when we are transparent in what we do, we not only make replication easier, but also we'll make it possible to basically weed out um, findings that are not as stable as we would like, right? So now basically there are lots of efforts at universities to improve reproducibility in STEM and the social sciences or hard social sciences, for example, psychology. Um, you see this, for example, by increased efforts to support replication, pre-registration by, uh, by journals, or establishing a, shul, uh, a culture of sharing, at its, uh, as it is called, and with a popping up of infrastructures, such as, uh, for example, uh, the Open Science um, Foundation, um, the use of programming or coding to basically share, make, make code available so that studies basically uh, or um, are really replicable, as I said, on the uh, click of a button. Now, in light of that, right? Now, we can, we can say that computation is really important, right? And we also can, it's evident that the analysis of language data using computational means is really the driving force of that computational revolution. And you could ask, okay, should corpses sit in language learning and teaching? take a chance to integrate computational skills into programs, right? What advantages are there? What disadvantages that I mentioned previously are there? And if Carl should decide to take this on board, 
I see that there's uh, essentially three main obstacles, right? In addition to the ones that I mentioned. The first would be that there's a lack of expertise. So few curricula in Haas, humanities, arts and social sciences teach computational skills, which also means that we have very few people who can do that, right? Who can teach those skills. So there's really a lack of expertise in the humanities when it comes to coding. <coughs> Excuse me. Secondly, as I said, there is a lack of motivation. The tools that we have are very good and really flexible. And the complexity of programming is a limiting factor, right? You can also say it's, it's not just, you know, the, um, uh, the tendency of people to stick with what they know, but it's really also that you can say, well, we have these tools, they are great, and they allow us to do what we need them to do. And so why should we change that? And that's true to a certain extent. And again, something that I hinted at previously is that there's a lack of resources. So it's not only the people that are missing, but also the entire infrastructure for basically training people is missing. Um, so if you were interested in, in introducing uh, programming, coding, or computation in language teaching and learning, then basically, you know, it would be very difficult because you have no infrastructures, you have no materials, no exercises, no syllabi to do that, and very few people. The last point basically leads me to talk about uh, something that I'm involved in, which is the Language Technology and Data Analysis Laboratory, LADAL, and the Australian Text Analytics Platform, ATAP, because both um, entities try to provide an answer to this lack of resources, because we try to provide an upskilling platform for coding in the humanities, arts, and social sciences. Now, what is LADAL? Well, it's an e-research uh, support infrastructure for computational uh, HAS. And as language is basically one of the most integral parts uh, to the humanities, um, any analysis of language data can be considered to be, uh, um, you know, at the core of computational HAS. Now, as part of ATAP, um, LADAL and ATAP present upskilling infrastructures that aim at enabling the development of skills. So it's not like that we uh, do stuff for people, but what we want to do is we want to provide materials and infrastructure um, for people to develop those skills, right? So we're not basically a service provider, but we provide infrastructure and materials, uh, particularly uh, focused on text analytics, digital tools and data management. So how to keep your computer, uh, computer safe and clean and basically how to avoid that basically everything on your computer looks like a mess and you have thousands of documents and files on your desktop and stuff like that. Also, we provide uh, materials for just learning computational methods and basic programming skills. Um, also how you can extract data from text, how you can transform language data and how you can process language data. Because 80% of the time that you spend with language data, you actually just, um, you don't do the proper analysis, that's 20% maybe, but 80% of the time, you just transform or reshape the data to be in a form that you can then analyze it, right? But also as communication is increasingly important when we talk about science, uh, we provide materials that show people how you can visualize data, including also geospatial mapping or interactive web apps, right? So we have tutorials on that. And also very importantly, especially in this context, is that we uh, provide guidance and materials for NLP, so natural language processing applications, can also be referred to as text analytics and various statistical procedures, including classification and machine learning. So really try to provide an infrastructure for the development of skills in computation with LADAL and ATAP. As I said, in terms of services that we offer, uh, it's mostly self-guided study materials, which are essentially online tutorials on topics related to data extraction, processing, management, and visualization, as well as statistical analysis, as well as learning to code, right? So these are basically uh, the core uh, um, issues that we focus on in the tutorials that we provide. 
We also provide face-to-face -face consultations uh, for people when they ask us and uh, hands-on practical workshops, as well as, for example, a webinar series. Um, in addition, what I'm going to show you today is an extension of what we've provided so far, which is an interactive notebook. An interactive notebook means that you can see code and you can um, basically run the code yourself and then produce an output. And the interesting thing about that is, is that you can basically see behind what tools do. So some of the things that we offer are really pretty much exactly what the tools that we've talked about in the previous talks are doing, but we let you look behind the scenes. Like what does the code look like that produces a certain uh, visualization or that shows you the collocations of a certain word? Or how do you extract uh, concordances, right? Using, uh, using code rather than a tool. And some of the graphs that you see here are taken from the Ladal tutorials. So uh, this, as we've heard about, is, for example, word clouds. We show you how you can create word clouds, but also geospatial mapping, how you can visualize and analyze liquid data, which are very common in uh, SLA research, um, how to um, use conditional inference trees, so tree-based statistical models, which are becoming more and more uh, prominent in um, uh, in research, in language research. Uh, here is basically box plots, which you might know, or violent plot, uh, plots um, that are very good methods for visualizing data. You have uh, rich plots here, uh, or visualizations of basically frequencies in, um, in tables, uh, where you have basically a display of uh, statistical differences in visualized form. Right. Now for this uh, talk, I sat down like probably about 20 hours and I wrote a tutorial specifically to address some of the needs uh, when you want to analyze learner language with R. So there are different programming languages, right? Uh, and I think the most prominent programming languages uh, that we use to analyze language data are Python and R. Um, R is probably the most dominant programming language in the language sciences or in Haas uh, because it's probably the easiest to learn program language. And most people who deal with statistical analysis have some fam uh, familiarity with R. And so we wanted to focus on basically extending the skills that are already present in the community, right? And here are just some um, visualizations from the tutorial uh, that I wrote uh, about analyzing le learner language with R. Again, I show how you can create word clouds, dispersion plots, box plots, uh, how you can visualize collocation networks, uh, how you can basically visualize and extract uh, differences between learners and native speakers or L1 and L2 learners, if you like, um, the distribution of uh, spelling errors uh, across learners with different language backgrounds um, shown as bar graphs or here another bar graph which shows uh, basically uh, frequency distributions of words in a text, right? And if you take this, um, this URL and you put it into your browser of choice, um, you'll be led to the adult tutorial, uh, which then basically shows you the code that produces all these different things. And it explains the methods that are used and what you can do with R or coding in this context. Now, just really quick, um, I'd like to show you uh, what the interactive notebook looks like. So this again is the uh, link to the Ladal website. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to take you to the website. Just let me sh stop sharing for a second and then share again here. Now you should see the Ladal tutorial for analyzing learner language. And the way that those tutorials work on the Ladal website are that basically we explain what this tutorial is about and then we show you code, right? Um, here, this is just a session setup. We show you how you can load data. And then when you've loaded the data, what the data look like. And here, for example, this chunk of code produces a concordance, right? Of the word program, uh, problem, right? So here, as you know, for example, as an in, uh, unconc or other applications, you see what comes before the word, then the keyword itself and what comes after the word, right? And this uh, chunk basically does that for um, the data that comes from learners. So I've provided some, um, some example data. So we have two um, 
files that represent native speaker data. And then we have essays by German, uh, Spanish, French, Italian, Polish, and Russian learners of English uh, taken from the International uh, Corpus of Learner English, uh, ITIL. And then basically we show different uh, uh, procedures, concordancing, how to, how to produce a frequency list and then visualizing frequency distributions, how you can split text into, um, into sentences. Uh, here also uh, frequency information visualized as a, um, as a word cloud, uh, how you can analyze sentence length. So a very simple uh, um, complexity measure and how you can visualize differences in uh, average sentence length and so on, right? So basically the LaDal tutorial shows you code and then shows you the output of the code, but you cannot do anything there, right? So it really just shows the code and the output. And most people basically then copy the code and um, basically copy it into a notebook when they use RStudio, for example, they copy that code into a notebook and then run the code themselves. And they can reproduce that or adapt it to match their own needs. Now for this tutorial, I basically linked to, a, um, to an interactive notebook that has the same content. And let me just see if I can go here. Yeah, so if you click on that, sorry, that was actually not the right one. But the problem is that now the controls are over there. Let me do it like this. All right, so this is the tutorial on analyzing learner language. So it's pretty much the same content, um, but it shows you not only the code, but can execute and actually change the code. So if you want to use the code, what you can do is uh, the first step is to uh, uh, copy um, that uh, Jupyter notebook, the interactive notebook is called a Jupyter notebook. And if you go to file and then uh, save copy and drive, a new window will open that will look exactly like this. But then you have a version where you can actually edit stuff. So if you open this version, you can just run code, but you can't change anything. But if you make a copy, you can actually change the code and uh, adapt it to your own needs. So it's like a tool, but in a notebook format. So this is a notebook format, if you like. So you have basically these uh, text chunks that explain stuff. And then you have code chunks, which do something, right? Now, the problem is because um, uh, this is really just you know, a, a test version, a demo, a prototype. Um, I used Google uh, Colab for uh, where I host this, um, this notebook. And it takes really long to um, install the packages. So basically, you need to install stuff that you then can use uh, the code uh, chunks. And this takes, uh, for the first time, about 10 minutes, right? So it's very long. So I've done it, I've prepared it before uh, the session. And I hope that I can just now run stuff. So here, for example, now that I've installed these packages, I can run the packages. And when I do that, I can then load data and it will display the data here. And the interesting thing is that you can actually now do that yourself. You can also load your own data. In this case, uh, just checking. You can, for example, go on the symbol and then upload files. And then you can put the names of those files here in these um, code chunks here. And then you can load that data. So this is really the data of the files that I've just put here, right? You can use this notebook for concordancing, in this case, I produce a concordance for the word pro problem. And because I've specified that I'm not really looking for the word problem, but this is a regular expression, meaning that I want to have the sequence problem and then anything that comes after that, if there is something. So it looks for problem and problems at the same time, right? So you have the concordance here. Uh, you can also look for a different word, uh, for example, I don't know, uh, let's say uh, transport. And in this case, uh, there's no transport in there, but you can basically look for other words as well, right? So you can actually change the code and then produce a different outcome. Uh, you can also uh, arrange the concordance according to, for example, what comes after the term, right? So we take the concordance that is here, uh, that is, basically ordered by the occurrence of the search term in the texts. 
and now it's uh, ordered by um, the first letter that comes after, so B F I O O T W, right? Or you can um, reorder the concordance by what's the last letter in uh, the previous uh, text, right? So what comes before the the uh, um, the search term? You can create dispersion plots here, for example, for the terms people and imagination. Again, you can use your own terms to do that. You can also look for phrases. Um, that's a little different because here I wanted to look for the word very and then any other word that comes after. So basically to check how do you people use the word very, what, what does it modify? And here you can say uh, that, well, in this case, it modifies adjectives like very seldom, very active, very simple, very interested, intelligent, friendly, right? And according to this, you might say, well, it's actually modifying mostly positive adjectives, right? This code chunk here produces frequency lists, right? You see this here, that occurs 650 times in the native speaker data uh, to so, so many times. Now, if I want to get rid of all those uh, non-lexical function words, I can do this with the anti-join uh, function that I show here, and then you basically have frequency list, but all the function words are excluded. And then you see here that uh, transport, people, and roads, and cars, and road are the most frequent terms in those texts. Here you can produce basically a visualization of the frequency information. I promised some word clouds, so here you go. Uh, this code chunk produces a word cloud, and you can also change the word cloud for other words, for example. Here's where I show you can split the text into sentences, uh, which can be very useful because you might be interested in the average sentence length. Now I apply the basically uh, counting words and splitting uh, text into sentences function here. And so you see that the first element consists out of two words, then 17 words, 23 words, 17 words, and so on. And now if you visualize that, you create a nice box plot with the uh, sentence length or average sentence length of the uh, learners uh, and the native uh, speakers in the uh, sample data that are uploaded. You can also use it to extract n-grams, in this case, the bigrams, the basic, basic dilemma, dilemma facing, facing the. So these would all be n-grams and bigrams in that ex example. You can also extract trigrams, right? So um, combination of three words, uh, and you basically have the advantage that you see the code. So if you do that in a classroom, you would not only be able to analyze language, but really teach people or uh, kids how to code. And you might say, well, that's too complex. Um, yeah, but in Finland, for example, which has an excellent um, education system, uh, Mika Leitinen has just introduced a project where um, students or pupils uh, from grade one onwards actually learn programming not really being users, but really learning programming, right? And my son, who's in second grade in Germany, is also part of a program where very, very young kids, uh, he's seven, uh, learn programming at school. And they learn that in a very, you know, playful manner. Uh, this would be something that they would not be interested in. Um, but actually, you know, the, the idea is to familiarize uh, children with programming procedures, right? And so if you basically run the code, you can uh, not only recreate what I've done, but you can also change it, you know, and uh, play around with code and see what it produces. And my aim here was essentially to uh, show you the code, um, to give you an opportunity to uh, play with it, to adapt it, and also show you versatility of code. And I'll just run some more codes to um, give you some examples. So here, for example, we find significant uh, uh, collocations, uh, sorry, significant uh, anagrams. And here it shows us that, well, if we take repeated um, testing into account, actually, because the data set is so, is so small, we cannot find uh, uh, anagrams that are significantly different in the learners and the native speakers, just because it's only a few essays, right? It's really just you know, a handful of, of um, data points. Right, um, yeah, but you can basically run the code yourself and see what it does. Uh, and here, um, one thing that might be interesting for many people is you can use this also 
to create visualizations of um, collocates. In this case, we show the collocation network of the word transport, because in the native speaker data, the essays were written about transport. And so here you basically see uh, what other words are used together in the same sentences as, uh, as transport. And the bigger the line is, right, the thicker it is, uh, the more frequent the word co-occurs with transport, right? And the bigger the word itself, the more frequently it is used, right, in, in the corpus itself. So you see that uh, public and transport, of course, obviously go together, right? Uh, their uh, collocation. But you also see rail and communities and use and roads being connected to transport. Also, because it's a common feature that we do in language analysis, I show you how you can post tag text. So to annotate the parts of speech, here we have an example sentence. Uh, it is now a very widespread opinion, blah, blah, blah. And we can apply the post tag function that we write here to that text. And what we get then is um, um, a post tag uh, sentence, right? And we can also apply that not only to individual sentences, but to um, all the uh, essays that we have, that we've loaded. Uh, for that, I clean the text here and I always explain what I do. And then we apply the post tag function. And now basically um, you see in action how the computer, in this case, a Google Cloud service, um, basically uses the function that we just wrote and applied to uh, the data and now it has finished and it has post tagged all the essays in uh, that I've uploaded. All right. So just some uh, few more here. Basically, we look at differences in the use of um, post tag sequences. Right. So because here was interested in are there differences uh, basically in um, the sequencing of post tags between learners and native speakers. And so I produced a table where I basically have all the different uh, post tag anagrams and then see how often does it occur in the learner data, how often in the native speaker data, how often in total, and so on. And then basically we perform a statistical test, which tells us are there actually significant differences? And yes, there are, right? So we actually have five significant differences in post tag sequences, right? Okay, I also, because we talked about it in previous seminars, I looked at um, different measures of lexical, lexical diversity. Here I only, uh, well, you can extract a couple of them. Uh, here I focused on the uh, Carroll's corrected type token ratio. When I apply that to the text, right, you'll see that uh, yeah, we get information about the lexical diversity of the text that we apply the, um, Next diversity function too, right? Let's go lower a little bit, right? You can also not only analyze lexical diversity, but also readability. So how complex is the text? How difficult is it to read? And in this case, I only focused on the uh, flash uh, index. And again, you can just uh, apply or run the code and you'll have basically the readability score for the different texts in uh, the data set. Uh, you can create then basically a mean value uh, for each language learner and check, okay, what's the distribution? And finally, uh, you can also use, for example, this to uh, check how many spelling errors there are in each text. And you'll find that um, there are some errors that you find here. Um, they're defined as something that does not occur in the dictionary. And here we have an error because you case, that's actually a possessive here, that's marked as an error. So it's not 100% correct, but it gives you a good idea because if you look at all the different uh, items here, you find that most of them do really represent actual spelling errors. And the interesting thing is we can apply that to the native speaker data uh, or also the learner data and then create a table of the results and then visualize the results. And to our surprise, we can see that uh, the native speakers actually make quite a number of spelling errors in the essays. And that uh, learners with a Polish and an Italian language background, at least in the little data set that I have actually make fewer uh, spelling errors compared to the native speakers. 
So that was my presentation and demo. Um, and I'd like to thank you all for sticking with me. I invite you to explore the Liddell website and the interactive notebook. I'd like to uh, thank, uh, uh, thank Peter and Fran for inviting me and letting me uh, share my thoughts on the role of computation in uh, computer system language learning and teaching. Okay, thanks very much, Martin. As usual, it's very difficult to clap over Zoom, but I'll, I'll do it on everyone's behalf. Thank you so much. There we go. Thanks very much, Martin. I do have a bunch of questions that I'm gonna ask uh, that I've been given in the chat. So I'll be exploring those very soon. Uh, just before we do that though, for the purposes of our video audience who will be watching on YouTube later, um, we do have in our next week's talk, Dr. Anna Frankenberg-Garcia, who is going to be presenting a application called Collocade, which I had a go of uh, in its beta stage as a trial. And uh, it's a great tool. And it's it's essentially like a, a concordance or a collocation tool that plugs in with uh, a, a text editor. So uh, it's very simple and straightforward to use. And uh, Anna is well published and well known in the field of Corpus Linguistics and Data-Driven Learning, English for Academic Purposes, and English for Specific Purposes. So it's going to be a real treat to have her uh, present next week. So uh, that was next week. Now let's turn back to this week when we've got some questions here from the audience. Uh, I'm going to stop the recording here, though. So for those of you who've been watching on YouTube or on our school website. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you all next week. Yeah, thanks so much.